15th lecture of church history. We're glad to have you here as a Fruitland class that is offered to anyone that would like to listen on our podcast. Today, we're going to be looking at the 20th century, and I've entitled this lecture From Billy Sunday to Billy Graham. Now, one of the most interesting facts, the greatest evangelist of the 1800s was a man named D.L. Moody, and he was still drawing huge crowds, still being used greatly by God until he had a heart attack in November of 1899, and then he died in December of 1899. It's almost like the last century closed off with D.L. Moody, and the question on everybody's mind was, will there be anybody who will take his place? Because this was someone God used in a great way. Well, several people made the attempt to fill the hole left by Moody. Um, R.A. Torrey had been mentored by Moody. Uh, when Moody died, R.A. Torrey was the pastor of Moody Church and was the president of Moody Bible Institute. He felt led of God to go ahead and take up the mantle of doing citywide evangelism around the world. Took about three years off, traveled the world, did the kind of meetings that Moody would have done. But... He got tired of being on the road, and he actually moved to Los Angeles and did what he had done in Chicago. He founded a new church. The church was called the Church of the Open Door. And one day after that, uh, J. Vernon McGee of Through the Bible would become the pastor there. He also decided to replicate the Moody Bible Institute, and he formed the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Today it's known as Biola. And so he got off the road. Another man that seemed to be the one that may take Moody's place was a man named Wilbur Chapman, and he did what Moody did. He got a great song leader named Homer Rodever, and they began to go to cities and preach and, and draw crowds and see people come to Christ. But after a few years on the road, he said, I'm going back to being a pastor. I sure understand that. I, I don't know how anybody could do what Moody and, and, Billy, and Billy Graham did through all those years. But when he, before Chapman quit doing the city evangelism, he had recruited a young man to be his assistant. The young man's name was Billy Sunday. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday never met his father. His father died in the Civil War before he was even born. His mother was so poor that she sent him and his siblings to live in an orphanage. She couldn't clothe and feed them. When he lit, went to live in the orphanage, the only thing he was really good at was baseball, and he was good at baseball. In 1883, he got a contract with the Chicago White Stockings. He soon earned the reputation of the fastest man in baseball, set records for the most stolen bases in a year, and they literally had a contest of who, who could race each other around and timed it around the bases, and he was the fastest man in the major leagues. was a great star. But in 1886, he was in his town of Chicago where he played and walked by the Pacific Garden Mission. That was the very first rescue mission in the, that was founded in our country. And one of the street preachers was preaching the gospel. He heard the gospel and he accepted Christ and became a Christian, began to grow in the Lord. Uh, in 1890... That desire to do something for God and outran his desire to be great in baseball. He was offered a huge extension for his contract and turned it down for a much smaller salary to become a YMCA worker. But soon after that, he was invited by Chapman to be his assistant. Now, when I say he was Chapman's assistant, he didn't let him preach. Uh, he would only allow him to speak to, say, youth events. I guess it was something good to have a baseball player come speak to young people. So he let him speak to youth events. But his basic job was putting the tent up, <laughs> doing all of the logistics. But he learned how you do that kind of citywide type evangelism. Uh, he preached very good sermons. And as he went from town to town, the crowds began to grow. One of the things about his preaching, I, I don't know that anybody ever preached the way he preached before this. Uh, he put his whole body in the sermon. Uh, there was one newspaper person, for instance, I've seen pictures where he stands up on chairs, smashes chairs, uh, you know, he would jump up on the, the, on, on the pulpit. Uh, this guy was athletic and he showed it. Uh, one time, he was trying to show how close it was, how the devil almost had him. So he took a run and start across the platform and slid like he was sliding in home under the de devil's tag. Uh, 
Uh, one newspaper person wrote about his preaching style. Sunday was a whirling dervish that pranced and cavorted and strode and bounded and pounded all over his platform and left them thrilled and bewildered as they had never been before. But millions heard him preach and an estimated 300,000 people came forward when he gave the invitation in his meetings. One of the things that he was passionate about was not just preaching the gospel, but it almost became obsessed with preaching against alcohol. He would always make sure that in his crusades he'd have one night where he'd preach his famous booze sermon. And he'd invite people to come down and take his hand and promise they'll never take another drink again. Well, he became one of the greatest supporters of a potential amendment for our Constitution, the 18th Amendment, which was later passed that brought prohibition into our country. And so he preached strongly against the dangers of drink and how if we got rid of alcohol, it would make our nation much better. And there were times when he would finish his booze sermon, grab an axe, and say, follow me. And the crowd would leave from where he was preaching and go find a saloon and bust it up. <laughs> so, uh, well, the crowds kept growing and kept growing until after World War I. Then Prohibition was passed. And then it didn't make America better, but it made Al Capone richer. And I think what happened is the people were kind of exhausted with that kind of preaching, exhausted with that kind of emphasis. And so the crowds began to shrink and he might have been discouraged and given up until he decided to do something he had not done until the 1920s. He went to southern cities to preach and he found a brand new home because people in south loved his style of preaching. They loved his preaching hard against alcohol and so he basically spent until he died in 1935 preaching in southern towns. Now, there were several black marks on his ministry that I need to mention. One black mark on his ministry was that he neglected his sons. They lived horrible lives. And he would admit that if he could go back, he should have been more of a, his, he and his wife should have been more present in their lives. They basically farmed them out and she traveled with him and she helped him do the evangelism. They had to pay blackmail. They had to pay newspapers to keep his sons out of the newspapers. Another thing that happened was he shallowed down evangelism from what D.L. Moody had been doing. If you remember when I talked about Moody, I said that Moody would invite people to come forward and then go into a counseling room. And in that counseling room, there were individuals trained to take each person aside by themselves with the Bible, talk through the gospel with them, make sure they'd grasped what the gospel was, and then lead them to trust in Christ if they were ready. All Billy Sunday did was that he covered the floor wherever he preached with sawdust and he would say come walk the sawdust trail and take my hand if you want to be saved so his total evangelism was asking people to come down they'd get a line they'd shake his hand shake his hand saved 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 and, and there's a sense in which that was a shallowing of evangelism that had detrimental effects that was a moving away from what moody had done but one other thing that was a great stain on the gospel in, D in Billy Sunday's life was that he made a lot of money in his preaching. Now, as they got bigger crowds, he would actually build temporary tabernacles where they would take wood, put it together, resell the wood afterwards. He would have love offerings. And the offerings, those, the meetings would take weeks or even months to preach in each town. But what he would do is once the expenses were paid, Everything over that went into his pocket. So he really became wealthy. He began to hang around with the John D. Rockefellers and folks like that. When one newspaper person complained, and this was a horrible quote, one newspaper said, how can you be so wealthy? He said, well, if you just look and see how much money I have and see how many were saved, you'll find it's only about $2 a soul. Well, that, that was hard to accept with the American public. There was a witty author in the 1960s named Sinclair Lewis. And he wrote a book that everybody knew was about Billy Sunday. It was called Elmer Gantry. And Burt Lancaster was, uh, they had a, it was, it was an Oscar nominated movie. And what it was, it was a picture of a Billy Sunday like preacher and then a female preacher who was much like another lady in that time, Amy Simple McPherson. But that was their way of showing disdain. In fact, after Billy Sunday, 
Many people wondered if there would ever be another evangelist. Would there even need to be another D.L. Moody? Because how can you win the trust of the, of the country back after that? But God had someone in mind who would prove to be above scandal and proved to be a humble man of character, and that man's name was Billy Graham. Billy Graham was raised on a dairy farm in Charlotte, North Carolina. At age 16, he attended a tent meeting led by an evangelist who was very much like Billy Sunday. Almost all the evangelists of that day and time were imitating Billy Sunday in their style of preaching. And he heard the invitation, come walk the sawdust trail. And he got out of his seat, went down there and took Mordecai Ham by his hand and he trusted Christ. Now, after World War II was over, we began to have a phenomenon in America that we'd never had before. There really was no, quote, teenage years. Because when the time when America lived on the farm, everybody worked, all hands on deck. And even in the early parts, before the child labor laws, people went to work. All of a sudden, after World War II finished and prosperity began to come into America, you began to have the days that are pictured by the show Happy Days, where there were teenagers with time on their hands that could hang around at the malt shop. And, and so there was a burden. What are we going to do to reach these teenagers? There was literally no youth ministries or youth ministers in churches at that day and time. So they formed an organization called Youth for Christ. And what they did was recruited good preachers who could relate to young people. And they'd go to city halls or, or convention places. And they would hold youth rallies with stirring music and strong preaching. And, and so that's what happened. Uh, they, they, that he, went, he became one of those. And he was very Billy Sunday-like when he began his ministry. And, and so... Uh, one of his best friends was a man named Charles Templeton. People say he was a better preacher than Billy Graham. Now, Charles Templeton later left Youth for Christ and went off to seminary, and he was exposed to liberal theology. And he began to accept what they were telling him, and he began doubting the Bible. And he would come back and see Billy and say, Billy, how can you be so simple in your faith? This book is not true. And he would cast those same doubts on the Bible that he had heard at seminary before Billy, Billy Graham. And Billy Graham was being affected by this. It caused a crisis in his life. So Billy uh, took some time off to go to a Christian conference center in California went out by himself in, the, in nature, found a stump, put his Bible on the stump. And he said this, Lord, I've got questions about this Bible that I can't answer. But today, by faith, I accept the Bible as your word. That was a transforming moment in his life. And in his autobiography, just as I am later on, he said almost all the questions I had that day that had not been answered, I found answers for them. There's just a couple of small things I haven't gotten answered, and I'll get those later when I get to heaven, he said. So he redeveloped a strong confidence in the Bible. And for those of us who heard Billy Graham on TV or in person, you know that his hallmark statement was, and the Bible says, and the Bible says, and he would quote scripture. I, I've listened to his sermons now that I'm a pastor myself. I can't find much of an outline. He basically went through the news and then said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. But God used that. As his popularity began to grow and he began to develop a team, a song leader named Cliff Barrows and others, they, they began to sense that God may be going to use them in great ways, but they'd better have a conference where they make some commitments to make sure the gospel won't be stained. They were preaching in Modesto, California, so they came up with what they called in 1948 the Modesto Manifesto. And they came up with codes of conduct, for, for instance, how you collect offerings. Uh, the fact that you've got to work with the churches. It cannot be done outside of working with the churches. They, they committed themselves to having outsiders like the police give the official crowd size rather than inflating it the way that some preachers and evangelists like to do. So the only crowd size that they reported was what was done by an outside organization. Uh, they, uh, he also made probably the most important commitment that he'd never be alone with someone who was not his wife. Uh, they call this today the Billy Graham rule. Mike Pence followed that, if you remember. 
And so he would never get in a car if there was just him and a woman. He would never go into a room if there was just him and a woman because he wanted to be above reproach and have nobody cast any aspersion upon his character. Later on, in the day of cable, he would literally have the, the motel or hotel remove the cable from his room so nobody could ever have accused him of watching something that was less than what a Christian should watch. That's how conscious he was of maintaining the standards that a, that a pastor should hold. In 1949, he held a meeting under a huge tent in Los Angeles, and a lot of well-known people were converted. Louis Zamperini, the former athlete, got saved there. Several actors got saved there. One famous mobster got saved at the crusade. William Hurst, who owned a series of newspapers across the United States, began to take notice of those conversions, and he sent out a two-word notice to all of his chain of papers. Those two words were Puff Graham. In other words, he wanted what was going on in Los Angeles to be reported across the nation. And so what that did was that all of a sudden elevated Billy Graham to a national stature. Now, let me talk about some of the things that I think Billy Graham wisely did and innovatively did in his ministry. One of the things that he did was he restored what D.L. Moody had. He restored having trained counselors to talk to those who came forward. I had the privilege of being a counselor at the 1975 Atlanta Crusade. So I went forward and, and would counsel with people as they came forward. Back earlier than that, he had films, and what they would do in the local theater, he would give an invitation, people would come forward. I think I watched, for Pete's sake, 17 times so that I could be there at the end of the film and be a counselor for anyone that came forward. So he trained counselors once again. Thank God for that. He pioneered new ways to share the gospel. Now, remember, he became famous in the country in 1949. That was the strong days of radio. TV was just beginning to be on the horizon. So he developed a radio program called the Hour of Decision, and it went for many years. Then he did something in the 1950s that many of my generation remember dearly. He began to broadcast his crusades on network TV. Oftentimes, I remember when I was young, there would be three nights in a row on either ABC, NBC, or CBS that he would purchase, and people all over the country would sit around their TVs and watch the crusade as it had happened in a major city. He also did those movies, The Restless Ones, for Pete's sake. But there were other things that are so commendable. When he did his first major meeting in the South, he arrived at the stadium before it was to begin, and someone had taken a rope and they had put the rope all the way down the stands. And they basically had said, the whites are on this side, the blacks are on that side. When Billy Graham saw that, he walked up to the top of the stands, took the rope, and pulled it all the way off. And he said, I will never have a meeting where people are segregated. Now, this, folks, was in the 1950s. That was a strong stand. He went overseas. He, was in, he went to London for some very effective meetings on more than one occasion, became a close personal friend of the current Queen Elizabeth. Um, he went to Korea, and in one, one night of his Korea mission, they, they took the entire Oida Island, and that night he preached to one million people in person in that evening. So extraordinary things happened. But there are other things that he did that you may not be aware of. He had a burden on his heart to equip and train uh, Christian leaders and evangelists from all over the world. But those people came from very poor background countries. And so he used the money that came in from the donations. And he would gather them in places like Lausanne, Switzerland, or Manila in the Philippines. And he, he would, or Seoul, Korea. And he would train these pastors, and that made a great kingdom impact. Billy Graham died at the age of 99 in 2018. Our Lifeway, the Southern Baptist Agency, did a, a, a summary of the impact of his life. 2.2 billion people heard him preach through TV and other media. 2.2 billion. 215 million people heard him preach in person. 
2.2 million people are estimated to have come forward to go to be counseled because they wanted to become Christians. He preached in 185 countries. His Hour of Decision program on the radio was continuously on the radio for 66 years. And 70, 700 nations, TV stations, uh, carried that, that program. Excuse me, 66 years on 700 stations that carried that radio, radio program. And there's a sense in which he's the glue to what happened throughout the last part of the 20th century. And I'm going to bring him back in once I mention three other things that happened in that century. Another great Christian leader was a man named Dawson Trotman. Dawson Trotman was a lost truck driver. And a pretty girl invited him to go to a youth meeting. And so he went, not a Christian, didn't have any background at all. The lady that was in charge of the youth uh, meeting challenged, divided everybody into two groups and challenged them. I'm going to give you ten verses on salvation. Memorize as many as you can in each group. Come back and the group that has the most verses memorized, they will get a hot dog party. Now that's pretty good for the 30s. And so he took those ten verses on salvation, came back, had memorized them all. He was the only one in either group that had memorized the ten verses. Well, she said, let's do it again. I'm going to give you 10 verses on the Christian life. And so he took those 10 verses, memorized it. Once again, he was the hero because he was the only one that had memorized that week. Later that week, after those 20 verses were memorized by him, God took those words and pricked his heart. He was driving his truck, had to pull off on the side of the road, and he led himself to Jesus based on the 10 verses on salvation. He began to have a burden because he lived near a naval base on the coast of California and he wanted to reach those sailors for Christ and help them grow in the Lord. So he befriended them. He would bring them home. His wife later on, as he got married, would feed them. And he had this, this desire, not just to witness, but to see that they had a strong faith so they could live for Christ when they were on their boats or at sea. Uh, one of the things that he did was he developed something called the wheel of the Christian life. And that was a wheel that has a hub in the middle, that's Jesus being Lord of the life, and four spokes. The top spoke is prayer. The bottom spoke is the Word of God. The, then it's got a spoke on each side. Those deal with your relationship with God, vertical. And then there were horizontal spokes of, the, of fellowship and witnessing. And that simple description of what a disciple is has helped motivate people to be able to say, I now know what I'm aiming at. Uh, a lot of times people say, we need to make disciples. And I want to say to them, what would one of those critters look like if you made one? And that wheel is a good example of what a disciple would look like. Now, when he began his work discipling these sailors, they decided to call themselves navigators because they were sailors. And so it became the organization called the navigators. In the early days, he had a motto with three things. If you're going to be a navigator... That means you're going to learn a verse a day, spend an hour a day with God, and try to win one soul a day, a verse a day, a life a day, and an hour a day. Now, they lowered that after a while. But navigators to this day are strong on giving materials and encouragement to do Scripture memory. Now, when Billy Graham needed someone to write his material to put in the hands of people when they came forward, he chose Dawson Trotman. So Dawson Trotman wrote that material. Unfortunately, Dawson Trotman, while he was at a Christian camp in Scroon Lake, New York, saw someone that was drowning in the lake, ran out, saved their life, got them to a boat, and then drowned himself in, in, at a young age. Now, one of the most influential movements of the 20th century was founded by a man named Bill Bright. Just as Youth for Christ had targeted teenagers, Bill Bright was led by God to target college students. Uh, he was going to Fuller Seminary, and just before he was about to graduate, he said he felt God say, quit and go do something. So he targeted UCLA. He began his work on 1951. He recruited some of his fellow Fuller students, some of the people from his church there, and they began to reach out to students. Within one year, they had 250 students coming to this early college ministry. That included the campus president. That included many of the athletes, including a man named Rafer Johnson, who would later on win the decathlon in the Olympics. Well, in 1953, he said, 
this, this needs to be done on other campuses. So he began to have a vision to form something that he called Campus Crusade. And, and he would target as many campuses as possible. And he developed a novel way to raise up a missionary force that's now being used by many parachurch organizations. He said, this is what I want you to do. If God's telling you to come join me, you go out and raise your own support. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends. Talk to your church. And you raise your support. We'll have a place where those people can give their money and get their tax credit. But you're responsible for raising your own salary. And that allowed him to raise up an army of workers. But one of the most important contributions that he had was when he wrote a tract called The Four Spiritual Laws. Um, he was hesitant at first because he didn't believe that the gospel should be just read to somebody from a tract. He didn't want a canned presentation until one of his friends challenged him. What he would do is he taught his campus crusaders how to draw some diagrams on a napkin and then quote scriptures and lead somebody to Christ. And the friend said, now, Bill, when you share the gospel and you draw your diagrams and you quote your scriptures, how many words are actually different each time you, print, you share the gospel? And, and, and does the gospel actually change from one presentation to another? And so he said, you're right. And he produced, produced this book. Over two billion copies of the four spiritual laws were shared with people during his lifetime. But I'm going to talk in my talking about Bill Bright by reading to you a tribute from his son just after he died. My dad, Bill Bright, grew up on a ranch in rural Oklahoma. Like his agnostic father and grandfather before him, he did not see God as relevant to his life. The only thing that mattered was money and success. Drawn to Hollywood as an ambitious young materialist, he routinely worked 100-hour weeks, growing his business through dogged determination. However, one day, a leading businessman whom he greatly admired said something that startled him. He said, Bill, making money is great, but the most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. Intrigued, my dad started studying the life of Jesus. A few months later, he became convinced that Jesus was who he claimed to be and became an ardent follower. Over the next 50 years, my dad's re resume grew into a testament of what God can do through one person who commits to following Jesus, holding nothing back. In 1951 at UCLA, he launched Campus Crusade for Christ, which became the largest missionary organization in the 20th century. When he died, there were 27,000 full-time staff, 250,000 trained volunteers in every country on the earth. The four spiritual laws that he wrote had two billion copies in print. He was the impetus behind the creation of the Jesus film, which has been translated into over 1,800 languages and viewed by an estimated 3 billion people. But then he said this, What most people don't know about this man I call Dad is what occurred behind the scenes revealing his humility. Uh, although he traveled 80% of the time for 40 years, he almost always flew economy as a faithful steward of God's money. For his last 50 years, he never owned the home he lived in. He was faithful to my mother to the end. He gave away all his retirement savings to help the Russian people hear about Jesus. He won the $1 million Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, and he gave it away within 30 minutes. For years, he quietly fasted one day each week, giving the money that he saved from fasting to help feed the poor. The, feed the poor. Now, one thing I want to mention before I get back to Billy Graham is there was also something that I witnessed with my eyes in the 1960s, 1970s. It was called the Jesus Movement. If you remember, that was the days of hippies and uh, protests and all of that. There was a middle-class pastor in Costa Mesa, California named Chuck Smith. And in 1969, he had a church that basically had um, 150 people in attendance. But he had a burden to reach all these hippies that were around him. As he reached out to those hippies, the church grew in two years' time to run 2,000 people. They had at first to open the windows and just let the hippies hang out and listen to what was going in. Now, it was not without a price. His elders came to him because they didn't like these people that were coming in and gave him an ultimatum. Pastor, either they go or we go. Now, you've got to remember the ones who paid the bills were those elders. And he said, I'm not going to tell anyone to leave. But God honored that. Also out of this church came the new Jesus music of that day and time. 
The group that's considered the first contemporary Christian group was a group called Love Song. They were a group of saved hippies who liked to play guitar together. And one day they wrote a song, came in to see their pastor. They were going to have a service that night and said, listen to this song. And he play, they played it to him and Chuck said, you're singing that tonight. And then it led to uh, producing a record company and a publishing company called Maranatha. Much of the praise music, if you want to, you know, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. All those kind of things came out of the Maranatha movement there. Now, this same Jesus movement had its greatest expression in 1972. Bill Bright had a burden to fill the stadium where the Dallas Cowboys played. And so he sent word around the country. Young people came. 80,000 people came for a several-day event. Billy Graham, here he comes again spoke seven times during that event. But they also had all the leading contemporary Christian groups that were there by 1972. You had Johnny Cash. You had Love Song. You had Andre Crouch, one of the best there was. Uh, Chris Christopherson was sober that day. And he sang. Uh, Larry Norman. They decided to hold a Jesus Music Festival on the last day, a day-long thing in the open, kind of like a Christian Woodstock. 200,000 people came. Now, as we close this series of studies on church history, we've reached a period where many of you were impacted or experienced this. I've heard Billy Graham more than once and was a counselor. I was led to Christ by Campus Crusade. I was discipled by the Navigators. In 1970, I formed a Jesus rock band and went around persecuting the Christians. And uh, so I've tasted most of what we have heard tonight. What, what happens when you look back at things like this, these great giants, is we recognize today that we're literally standing on the shoulders of those who came before. But that also gives us a responsibility that we need to be people worthy of laying the foundation that those who come behind us, those, those who will still come to the scene, will be able to build on the foundation that we've laid because it was a good foundation. Now, your essay question for this particular uh, lecture is this. The, 19, the 1900s were the period when we began to develop something called parachurch ministries. Uh, none of the ones I've mentioned were pastors. They all worked outside the church, but they worked to aid the churches. So we have parachurch groups like Youth for Christ, Campus Crusade, Navigators that we've talked about. Many of you may have been involved in those or your, your churches may have been involved. So your essay question is this. Tell me about either the impact pair church groups had on your life or the impact you saw that they had on other Christians you know or on the churches you've been a part of. Now thank you for this journey of 15 lectures and I hope you've been blessed.